Good morning and uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, before we begin our continue our study on uh, Gideon on Judges chapter seven, we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the time that we have to study together. We are thankful for the way that you have led in these studies and the things that we have seen. And we just pray, Lord, that your spirit can continue to teach us, that we can have a conviction and a power in our lives. We pray for those around us, those that we have contact, that we can reflect your character. And we pray for our personal needs, um, living in this world of sin and suffering. We ask for your healing to happen for those that need it. And we ask, Lord, that we can be faithful in the little things that you ask us to do each day. We ask for your angels' guidance and protection. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Be with us now as we open your word together. May you bless the reading of your word. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning, everyone. Now, we spent uh, the last two studies, Wednesday and Thursday, looking at the 300. Now, what did we learn about the 300 by studying the symbol of the 300? Does anybody remember how, how, we, how we understood that symbol? So we've we've actually gone over quite a few things. Um, one of the first things that we noticed was uh, the the first uh, mention, which was the the years, I believe, or yeah. Methuselah lived three hundred years. Three hundred years, and uh, right. then the next thing we uh, see Enoch, the, Enoch, like, Enoch lived three hundred years after he begat Methuselah. Right. Yeah. And then there was the 300, uh, uh, the measurement. Uh, we, we actually, I think we put it into judgment uh, because of the length of the arc, the 300 cubics. Um, and we kind of attached a judgment um, symbol to yeah. the 300. Yeah, so Noah's Ark. And then there was more. We had the, the spears and stuff, but we were trying to figure out whether or not uh, the spear's weight had anything relevant um, with the 300 that we were looking at. Well, we had the 300 pieces of silver that, uh, um, and five changes of raiment. So we saw 300 in connection that was for with Benjamin. Some, for Benjamin, yeah. That Joseph and gave him from Pharaoh, wasn't it? It was Pharaoh actually that was giving him these things, but um, Joseph well, was the issuer. Well, yeah, Joseph, Joseph does that. Right. Um, and then you have, um, of course, uh, the 300 in Gideon itself, when we went through that list. Um, and then we also had um, the, the 300 foxes. We had the periods of 300 years, which we really still haven't um, resolved. Stephen and I have to go through that. And deal with that chronology, though Stephen seems to have a good solution to it. Um, and then we had the spears weighing 300 shekels of brass, and the spear is used against 300 to slay them. And, and so brass symbolizes judgment, so does, of course, being killed. And then we said the idea of the spear is this represents the lines. Uh, and lines pointing to something. And we have the 300 shields that are then going to be replaced with 300 shields of brass. So in all these different things. Um, Can we put that, that 300 shields as another judgment? Well, when they're turned into brass. So, so the thing about the 300 is, I mean, 
like all symbols, you know, symbols can have more than one meaning and they can have a positive right. side and a negative side um, to it. Right. Because obviously we look at Gideon's 300 as those that are chosen. Right. That's a positive thing. Yeah. And, and we had applied the 300 then to, um, and Jeff had applied this to the July 18, 2020 prediction. So the idea was that this movement had been whittled down to 300 after Parminder's group had left. And uh, we now stood in this, uh, this point where we were giving this message. Now, we know that Gideon represents the Sunday law. So in some ways, we were looking at July 18th as connected to the Sunday law in that it would begin this period of time. Nashville would be attacked. Uh, uh, the Parthenon would be destroyed as Ellen White saw in vision. And then <clears throat> this would lead to the Sunday law, December 25th, uh, 2021. Not that the Sunday law would happen that day, but because that's a Sabbath. Uh, but that somehow the Sunday law would follow after that. Now, of course, part of what we saw, and Odilio showed this, is that we could line up these mandates with our line, with the 777, and that we could see that <clears throat> these mandates <coughs> were a type of the Sunday law. So The problem that I had with Odilius is just his trying to connect it with Trump being reelected, which I didn't see anything in that that suggested it. It would just show that we were under a type of the Sunday law with the pandemic, which is what we already understood. Um, but we now know that these 300, um, I mean, we can still apply them to our line, but they're applied in type. So. So we can still make an application of this 300 to something that's future. At least that's the, the position that I've taken. And, and that's because of how we've lined up this story of the judges, where we put this on a line. So when we put the 300 on a line, I don't have that up there anymore. But when we put the story of Gideon, um, we're going to line it up with, with what? What history? It's going to follow the story of dealing with, um, I always forget the names, uh, Deborah and Barak, dealing with Sisera, right? So, so we, we look at something that happens after that. You know, what, what were some other things we did with the 300 as far as a number? How did we connect it to the 273? And what does that mean? Well, that would take us to Numbers, chapters two and three, I think. So. Yeah, yeah. So Numbers, uh, chapter uh, two and three, and and we're going to have the three hundred. There is the difference. So there's twenty two thousand three hundred, but they only count the twenty two uh, thousand when they do the calculation when they subtract. They get 273 that are they're going to have to pay this uh, redemption money to the firstborn. So, but also when we look at Acts chapter 27, so numbers three and Acts 27 go together as the 273. Um, Ellen White says that the number of people on the boat were 300, right? So she rounds it up to 300. And the difference between 300 and 273 is 27, right? right. That's how we actually made that connection, I, th I think. Yeah, that's initially how we made the connection, though I understood the connection already dealing with Acts, Numbers chapter 3. I didn't know about Ellen White's uh, 
saying that there were 300. I mean, I probably knew about it, but I never thought about it. So, so when we look at this 300, it would be about a message to the Levites. And we know when we look from July 18th to December 25th, 2021, so July 18, 2020, it's 273 days. Or not, pardon me, it's not. It's 252 days from July 18th to March 27th, 2021, and then 273 days. So we have this symbol of the Levites in two different ways. The 252 brings us to the symbol of the Levites, and then 273 days, which is the symbol of the 27th of March, brings us to December 25th, 2021. So if we're looking at the 300 here, and it, it at least brings us to December 25th, 2021. Okay, and any other thoughts on that? Now, I can't remember exactly where we were in the story of Gideon. We mostly were addressing the 300 for the last little bit. We talked about um, the trumpets, what they represent, and what the pitchers represent, and what the lamps represent. So the pitchers would represent what? I believe your point was that the pictures represented humanity. Right. So we have this treasure in earthen vessels. God's the potter, we're the clay. And, and so that symbol is uh, used in scripture to represent humanity, right? Now they're empty pictures, it says, but they're going to put the lamps inside those pictures. So what are the lamps? The light of the word. Okay, the light of the word. Uh, we also know that you don't hide your lamp under a bushel. Jesus uses a parable. And in that parable, the lamps represent what? The gospel. Well, the gospel. But I think more specifically, uh, doesn't it apply to Christ's character. Aren't they reflective of each other? Yeah, yeah. But when we think about it, that if we are to reflect Christ's character, you know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, uh, you know, has to do with, I mean, it's not a biblical verse, but it's based on a biblical idea that the glory of Christ must be seen upon his people. And, um, so we need to be empty of self and we need to be filled with the light of Christ's character and the trumpet, which is a pretty obvious symbol of proclaiming a warning message. Now we had also spent time when we studied this about the fact that there are three companies. Um, and, and we had attached this to the symbol of three itself in the three days but here we have 300, and then it's divided into three companies. And we had attached this to the story of Ezra as well. So we know the story of Ezra brings us to the 20th day of the ninth month, which December 25th, 2021 is the 20th day of the ninth month on the biblical calendar. Now, we also have another three days, which I can't remember. If, I, I think I slightly referred to it, but I didn't... Uh, go into detail. And that has to do with um, um, Jehoiachin when he's released from prison. And he's released on the 25th day of the 12th month. Right? So in Jeremiah 25, it came to pass in the seven and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, uh, in the 12th month, in the five and 20th day of the month, um, 
that evil Merodach, King of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, King of Judah, and brought him forth out of prison. Right? So we know uh, it talks about the diet that's given to him, and there's actually a record of this uh, diet, which includes his sons. So Jehoiachin's sons are also fed um, with this portion, uh, continual diet. So the grain tra uh, grain ration tablets uh, record this. Um, but the date that's here is the, tw the 25th day of the 12th month, right? So the 12th month in the five and 25th day. But we also see this same passage in Second Kings. Um, and it's in Second Kings. Let me see if I can remember. Yeah, so 25. Um, it came to pass in the 7 and 30th year of the captivity. So it's, it's the 37th year. That means it's 36 years that he's been captive of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, in the 27th day of the month, or the 7 and 20th day of the month. Um, so here, what we see is if we were going to count in an inclusive way from the 25th to the 27th, it's how many days? Inclusive is three. Yeah, so it's three days. Right? So we could call it three days from the time that he's uh, uh, released from prison and, and then from the time that he's... Um, now, it's, it's kind of obscure because in the English, you don't really see it. You see it more in the Hebrew. Um, so there's some differences in the language. Um, so let me see if I can just quickly go back. So let me click on this verse. So when we look at this one, it says, Evil, evil Merida, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him forth out of prison. And um, in 25, 2 Kings 25, 27, it says, uh, Evil Merida, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiachin, king, king of Judah, out of prison. So one, it says he brought him out of prison. One says he lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, out of prison. Um, there's also a difference in how they describe the year of his reign, the year that he began to reign and in the first year of his reign. So one is, is actually describing a, um, an accession year. The other one is describing more uh, the start of his year. Now, um, evil Merodach, since he's the king of Babylon, um, he he actually technically becomes king on the first day of the first month, right? So that he's going to have and the Akitu festival. That's when he's going to be. Um, uh, I can't I can't think of the word offhand, but um, um, you know, it's like his inauguration, right? So he's going to become king even though technically he is king, but really the, they do um, uh, a type of dating where the preceding king, so that would be Nebuchadnezzar's reign, is still being counted until evil Merodach gets to the first day of the first month. In some ways, though, they will talk about um, his accession year as part of his first year sometimes. So there's there's kind of a little bit of um, things that aren't quite clear on how they always do it. There isn't the consistency, I guess. So. Okay. So. <clears throat> so why do I bring this up, these three days here? And this, the 25th day of the 12th month, but also the. 27th day of the 12th month. What, what is this? How, how is this connected with this 300 while we're studying in Judges?
because we have the three companies. Do these three companies represent three days? That could fit. Yeah. I mean, three baskets represent three days, three uh, clusters of grapes represent three days. You know, we have, we have a symbol here and we already have the three days attached to the 20th day of the ninth month. So to December 25th, 2021, we have those three days attached that call to come to confession and repentance. So we've taken this three days or this, um, and, and we have the 300 here, but do the 300 then have to experience a conversion that's represented by three companies and also by these empty pitchers and these lamps within the pitchers and that these have to be broken, the, the pitchers do? It, it appears to me to have a significance in that manner. Yeah. Because when we look at the story of Gideon and we see this, this message of the 300, we know they're whittled down to 300, but then the 300 have to act. And we took this warning, this blowing of the trumpet, sort of in connection with uh, July 18, 2020. But we should maybe see that July 18, 2020, March 21st, 2021, and December 25th, 2021, are more about um, um, this conversion process that has to happen with the 300. So the 300 have to divide into three companies. And, and what we see here is a type of order, a, a purpose, right? This isn't something random, that this attack done against the Midianites. And we take the Midianites as being a symbol of uh, critical spirit, right? Strife. So the enemy that's really being defeated here is an internal enemy within each one of us. And this would explain the experience that we're having presently. So my... So that's so now, the future. Yep. I'm sorry. So now <laughs> we're, we're making the connection to um, instead of when we say internal, so we have a symbol right there, the word internal, mm -hmm. to be inside the movement. And then now uh, it's inside each one of us. A and that makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because each one of these people, each one of these 300 have this uh, pitcher and this lamp and a trumpet. So, so when we look at Gideon defeating Midian, so when we start to look at... Um, now, also notice that when, we, when I blow a trumpet... I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. I mean, that's Judges 718. I mean, obviously we're in Judges chapter seven and we're going to get verse 18 um, at some point, but it, it's happening in a key verse, this command to when he blows the trumpet, that they are also to blow their trumpets. And this would be the July 18th warning. <coughs> Um, and then that makes we, sense. Yeah. And then when we look at the next verse, so Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came onto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. So when we look at the middle watch, what does that symbolize? Uh, midnight. Yeah. So midnight. And it also represents... Um, uh, a chiasm, a chronological chiasm, right? Right. When you have the middle of something, uh, it suggests that.
So we can see the symbol of midnight here. And, and then they're gonna blow the trumpets and break the pitchers that are in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand to blow withal. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shitta in Zerah, Zerareth, and to the border of Abel Mahola unto Tabath. So um, we haven't really looked at the meanings of these words, at least I haven't. Um, So what do we see here with this? Uh, with this story, what are we seeing? How would we apply this? This breaking of the pitchers and this the blowing the trumpets and uh, the Midianites turning their swords against one another. What about the left hand? Left and the right hand, yes. Yeah, there's that's significant as well. Mm -hmm. That's the north and the south, or the east and the west. I mean, or what's the north and the south? North and the south, right? Well, it represents a message which is victorious. Okay. So if we look at July 18th, um, was the message victorious? I would have to say no. Okay. Uh, not for us, per se. I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't get that vibe out of that whole um, situation. Okay. Well, ultimately, it has to represent victory. Yeah. Uh, I see someplace down the trail, maybe, that we've also studied, you know, how we started looking at those lines and judges and how we started paralleling what was going on. We were pretty close to even, you know, what was going on at that particular moment in time and space when we, we, we actually did the studies. Yeah. Okay. So, so a number of things here. So we have lots of different symbols. We have the three companies, of course, which you were saying represents three days and, and they blow the trumpets. Um, and, and this three companies representing three days also represents order, right? So this is a type of organization that occurs under this message of Gideon, which we haven't really seen other than you know, the movement was able to put together um, some advertisements that were put in the Tennessean, but, and, and to get a website up. But I think this much more re relates to the aftermath of July 18th of, of the date itself. So they have their lamps in their left hand. Now, the left hand is. Um, I believe, I always think it should be the other way around. So I always keep flipping it around in my head. That's the North and the right hand is the South. Um, and so this also can be a message about the North and the South. And they, of course, they give a cry, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And Gideon represents this message of July 18th. But if this enemy is this critical spirit that exists, we would have to say that this hasn't yet, we still haven't had this victory. Correct. Yeah, we can say that the that in a sense we've been whittled down to the 300. And the 300 has been given its command, but the actual proclamation of July 18th is not what's being described here. 
Now, we have other symbols in Judges 7.22, uh, which are these places. So they fled, and that is the Midianites are going to flee to Beshitta. So that's just the house of the acacia tree, the Shittim wood, right? Mm. Um, in Zerarath, um, and um, so this is a word that means oppression. Um, so it's from a root, unused root meaning to pierce or puncture. And um, to the border of Abel Mahola, and that means the meadow of dancing, um, city of Issachar, birthplace of Elisha. And, and then we also have uh, Tabath, which is celebrated. All right, so we have this. place east of the Jordan. So these are the Midianites are going to flee to these place, places. So what would these different things symbolize? I mean, you got a place of dancing, celebrated, but you also have the house of the acacia tree or the shittim tree, and you have um, oppression. So remember, the 300 isn't really a group of people per se, right? It, it's really a symbol of a message. So the whittling down to the 300, would that be more a refinement of a message rather than how we tried to take it as 300 people? Or, well, or if we're trying to apply it to um, as symbols, then it would it would make sense that it's not literal people because we were, we're, we're looking at figurative stuff. Yeah. Cause Jeff had implied it, you know, we've been whittled down to this 300, so to speak from um, this larger group that existed prior to uh, the Omega taking over. But we would have to look at this more as a message. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to, we we have, have isn't it about taking the person out of it? Isn't it about taking yeah. self out of it? Yeah. And, and of course, you know, people are attached to a message. People give a message or reject a message. That's so, right. I mean, since people are, are always attached to these messages, like we can say Parminder is attached to the message of Sisera. Well, then don't they become but, a symbol? But yeah, that's what they become as symbols, right? Right. So to understand these symbols and how they apply and to understand that our line is typical, that it's still it's typical of something that's going to come. <coughs> the thing that's going to come is the real Sunday law. Right. So so we can't take it what has happened to us as the real Sunday law. The pandemic has all the symbols of a Sunday law and we can atti attach the story of Gideon to our movement in giving the July 18, 2020 prediction and all the structure attached to it. But we know that this ultimately is referring to something still in the future. Mm -hmm. That our movement has typified, that our message has typified something that's going to happen, which would be the loud cry. And, and again, you know, we're, we're trying to understand the lines. Um, I was reading um, this morning, Heidi and I, uh, reading from the story of redemption. Um, and in the story of redemption, she's going to give uh, one of her accounts of uh, the message of Revelation 18, right? And how that comes about. Here, I'm just going to bring it up here quickly. Uh, So it's going to be, I think it's the chapter, The Loud Cry, 58. 
Okay, so I'll just share this screen. <clears throat> this is a point that you know I've I've tried to emphasize. I don't know if people understand it uh, completely, but here you're going to have um, um, Ellen White seeing this this event. Revelation 18, verse 2, she's going to refer to. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth, and again ascending to heaven, prepare, preparing for the fulfillment of some important, important event. Now, this angels hurrying to and fro symbolizes the studying of a message, and this ascending and descending uh, symbolizes this work connection between heaven and earth. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, angels and descending, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, right? Jacob's ladder. Right. I saw I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel. So this is going to be the angel of Revelation 18, and give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere as he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, of course, we know that this is not about an angel literally descending and giving this message, that it's God's people who give this message. It's just symbolized by an angel. Same with the first and second angels messages. Angels don't give those messages. Men do. But they're symbolized by these angels giving messages. That's right. Yeah, the message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation, which they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them, and they united in fearlessly proclaiming the third angel's message. So we would have to look at the story of Gideon as parallel to this, right? Because we have the loud cry. We have the glory of Christ's character, right? The glory filling the earth. So the story of Gideon really applies to this event, but we are applying it to our movement at the present time. Now, uh, she goes on, angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities." This message seemed to be an addition to the third message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. So Ellen White is paralleling the loud cry to the midnight cry. And, and an, a, originally, this is how Jeff had done this. Initially, he had taken the idea, what Ellen White is saying here, and that the midnight cry was parallel to the loud cry. So when he first had his lines, <coughs> that's where he put the midnight cry. The midnight cry was the loud cry. There was no midnight cry before the Sunday law initially. But as time went on, he came to recognize that there was a midnight cry that preceded the Sunday law, which seems to contradict what Ellen White is saying here. That is, she doesn't, she doesn't parallel, she doesn't take the midnight cry and put it before the Sunday law. She puts it after the Sunday law because it's the loud cry. Now, how did Jeff initially justify putting a midnight cry before the Sunday law? What was his reason for doing so? Does anybody remember? Well, with the midnight cry uh, proceeding, the shut door, mm -hmm. October 22nd, you have there in the shut door, one door is shut, but another door is open. Okay. And uh, with the Sunday law, the, the door is shut to the seventh day of witness. 
but then another door is open okay. to those who have not had light. Right. So you have a midnight cry before that. Mm -hmm. So what he was doing is he's he's taking the Sunday law and making it a close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists. So initially on his lines, he didn't have a Sunday law as a close of probation for Adventists. He just had the close of probation. He had the time of the end, the Sunday law, the close of probation. Those were his three way marks. But as time went on, we started to zoom in. Now, we weren't aware of what we were really doing. But um, the point that I was asking about specifically had to do with the fact that there is a closed door on April 19th, 1844, and that there is a midnight cry that precedes the close of that door. That is, the Millerites believed they were giving the midnight cry in 1843, initially. So Jeff took that and said, well, we have a midnight cry before this close of probation. And, but it's, it's not the true midnight cry, right? Because the true midnight cry is the one that's going to happen with the seventh month movement. And that's how initially he justified it. He said, there are two midnight cries. And so originally he was sort of lining up uh, the midnight cry that we were putting in our line before the Sunday law. He was lining it up with the midnight cry that occurred before uh, the close of probation for the Protestants. But he didn't do that for long. He, he, he did that initially as a justification, but never referred to it again, as far as I could tell. Um, we just ended up with midnight, the midnight cry before the Sunday law. So we had the way marks at that time when he did that, because we had now had the midnight cry being the first day of the fifth month. We then had the first day of the fifth month as the center of three way marks, the first being the first day of the first month and the other one being um, the 10th day of the seventh month. And these lined up with 9-11, uh, the Sunday law. Or, or pardon me, 9-11, the midnight cry, and then the Sunday law lining up with October 22nd, 1844. So, so, but Jeff was actually zooming in to these way marks, but he wasn't, he wasn't aware of what he was doing. He wouldn't have said, well, this is typical of this, though he did say that way marks were typical of other way marks. So he hinted at it, but he didn't really know how to sort it out. So we understand that a lot more that when we zoom into a way mark, there is a reform line, that these aren't reform lines that are staggered with each other, but you're actually just looking into a way mark and seeing a reform line. <clears throat> so when we apply Gideon's 300, um, the story of Gideon to um, to our movement, we have to be zooming into one of the way marks on a bigger line, the line above us, whatever line that is, whatever way mark it is. Would we agree with that? that we're making an application of the story of Gideon of the 300 to our movement, but that it's typifying something that's going to happen in the future, which would be the Sunday law. Yes. Okay. And, and I don't know if people understand it or they have difficulty with it at all. It, um, it's hard to keep completely tracking on all of this stuff. I mean, um, which line we're on. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, because we haven't really defined this yet. We haven't really said, what line are we on? What way mark are we zoomed into on and that? The, and aren't these the questions that we're <laughs> supposed to have? I mean, uh, we're, and, and aren't we, this is what we were trying to address in the very beginning of all these studies of understanding mm -hmm. the lines. Yeah, well, see. We're not there yet. We're getting there. 
Yeah. So after July 18th, I mean, it became really clear that we were in a typical line. I mean, even before July 18th, I knew we were. <clears throat> but the movement hasn't really embraced this idea of the typical lines. Because that's why we're, we're still sort of going along the track that we had before, um, before July 18th, that we're in this Sunday law, but that this is the real Sunday law, not a typical Sunday law, even though we... We say, well, the pandemic was a type of the Sunday law. We're still looking for the Sunday law to just directly come out of it without all of the things that need to occur that this movement has to accomplish before the Sunday law actually comes. So Adventists are going unwarned. Well, the whole purpose of this movement is to warn Seventh-day Adventists about the coming Sunday law. That's right. And if, if they're unwarned, we can't expect a Sunday law. And we're making the same mistakes as the Millerites in as they approach the second coming of Christ. All these worldwide events that were supposed to occur haven't occurred, but they just set them aside. And, and the movement has done the same thing. We've just set aside all of the things that we need to see happen. <clears throat> and we just become a little bit myopic. We're focused upon and I mean, one analogy I use, of course, is finding a, um, a route up a mountain and that people can become really focused upon finding a route and, and continue on the wrong course uh, and end up at a dead end, literally, um, because they, they weren't willing to backtrack. They weren't really willing to see where they went off a path. Uh, so it's maybe not a perfect analogy, but we, we'd be kind of become a little bit um, uh, bullheaded in continuing down a path rather than recognizing uh, where we are. And so I think that part of what has to happen in this movement is we need to recognize where we are and what needs to be done what needs to be accomplished first within our ourselves, but also um, within the movement. And that definitely you can't take the story of Gideon and take the 300 and, and the breaking of the pictures and the trumpets and say that that's already happened. Even though we, we applied it to July 18th, we know it, it's referring to a work that occurs in connection with the message of July 18th, but it doesn't, it, it can't be um, the publication of the July 18th prediction because it doesn't have the characteristics that these symbols are showing. We don't see us reflecting Christ's character. We don't see these pictures broken. I mean, we could say that a trumpet warning went out, but that warning is still incomplete. It's still going out. It still needs to be completed. It's a work is begun, but it's not done. Yeah, the trumpet went before the uh, before the pitchers were broken and the torches were lit, right? Yeah, it's um, yeah, they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands. Now, I'm yeah, not, there's an order of succession. Yeah, it, it it presents them in that order, right? Right. And I think that's kind of what we could say. We could say that the proclamation of July 18th is that trumpet, right? It still must sound right. It's not like it's complete. It's progressive. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. Okay. Dwight. okay. If, you, if you go back to the question in the manner that Ron had just asked it, let's remember that the torches were lit and then were placed into the pitchers. Mm -hmm. because right. they can't they can't light the torch after the pitcher is broken right so having the, the torch lit i would say would be your first step your second step is placing the pitcher over it the third is to hold the the trumpet aloft yes the trumpet sounds first then the pitcher is broken which would mean that the humanity is now shattered. 
Mm -hmm. And the light is now being given. Right. And so we can take putting the lamp because the lamp here is the message, right? Right. This is the message. Agreed. Right. Right. And so this movement has been preparing a message and, and um, the pictures represent humanity and humanity has been taking and studying these messages and putting this light inside of them. Right. And also being preparing the trumpet to give a message. But we know that in order for this message to do its work, those pictures have to be broken in order for that message to shine. So the work that's been going on, you know, since 1989, if you want to want to go back there to the time of the end, this increase of light has been this work in developing a message because we know the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers and the development of that is is development of both a people and a message so people are involved in this in the development of this message but in order for that message to have its effect self has to die and the message the light of the gospel has to shine christ's character has to be revealed Having these pictures and putting the lamps inside of them and having a trumpet in your hand isn't enough. So, so what, you know, what Dwight's saying, what you're saying, these both go hand in hand. No pun intended. <laughs> no pun taken. Yeah. Okay. So... <clears throat> So here we have this message. The left and the right hands are both involved. That's the message of the north and the message of the south. Right? The message of the north representing the message of Babylon. The message of the south representing Egypt. Right? Right. Which we, we can still attach to... Um, the message of Islam as well. Right. Okay. So, so there's, there's lots of things here, lots of symbols. And we have the, these four cities and, and the two have a certain characteristic. One is, uh, one has to do with the acacia tree, right? That is the house of the acacia tree. The other one is oppression. And then the other ones are more po positive, meadow of dancing and celebration. Um, so does this represent two classes within this movement? Even though this is the Midianites who are fleeing, we know that the Midianites represent um, strife. So is this representing those that end up conquering self and those that end up not conquering self? I don't know. That's just a suggestion. I'm not sure why these, because the acacia tree again represents um, uh, a negative thing, even though you know it's used as in the in the sanctuary. Any yeah, ideas about the acacia that? would wasn't it all covered with gold though? Yeah, I know it's covered with gold. So it represents sort of humanity. Right. Um, yeah, because wood we relate to, or trees we relate to being uh, humans. Yeah. And my, understand, and my understanding too is that this acacia wood would have to be sort of laminated. Um, like it has to be, it's not like a big giant tree that you can just cut into timbers. Um, it's more almost like a bush. So to build so, yeah. out of it, you have to laminate it. Yeah, um, working with like oak and different hardwoods, mm -hmm. um, it's it's not good to try to carve something out of a solid chunk. So what we do in um, carpentry is we uh, put together blocks 
uh, yeah. we squeeze them all together, you know, with gl wood glue <laughs> and whatnot. And then we, um, make the carving out of that. Yeah. And that's what is, it's understood of how they built things with acacia wood. Right. Yeah. It makes it really nice. And it, you don't get the, the, the big cracking lines that end up showing up in, uh, in like log work. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, now the men of Israel, they gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. So we're going to see this unity in the movement to oppose this critical spirit. Is that how we're going to look at Judges 7.23? Please repeat that, what you said. Well, is this some kind of organization that occurs within the movement? This gathering themselves together? Yeah, out of, well, it kind of appears that way, uh, some sort of an organization, not necessarily um, anything on a, like a, a big official level. It was like hurriedly gathered together, right? Yeah, and here the idea, this word gather themselves together is from a Hebrew word that means to shriek. So, I mean, this is a call. Yeah. Call out of Naphtali, out of Asher, out of all Manasseh. And also we're going to have these messengers sent uh, throughout uh, Mount Ephraim. So the how did Ephraim. you term your question again? Does this represent some kind of organization? In the sense that there is an order um, in in attacking this, that um, attacking the Midianites. Yeah, and, and is it is it is it a coincidence? There's three. Well, there's three, and then, and then there's four because you have Ephraim as well. Oh, okay. Right, so it's a three four three one combination. <laughs> yeah, three one combination. So. All I'm saying is that the, the order, the work that needs to be done is going to come after some sort of order. Now, I'm not, not ever suggesting we organize a church mm. and try to do things from the top down, which was tried before. Um, but I do believe that God has order. Ellen White's quite clear about that. Um, and that every man isn't an independent Adam just doing whatever he thinks that he should do. That's right. Right. So. So we need in, and we need Christ's character in order to work to bring all the different elements together. Correct. Um, so this shows that the message is going to, to go, right? It's going to be accomplished, but it's after God's order. And so here we can see the loud cry and, and the call uh, that brings all of these workers together to give this message from all these various churches from northern Israel, which represents the Protestants. But, you know, here is where we have this issue, going back to the loud cry and the midnight cry. So we know that the midnight cry is something that happens um, before the Sunday law, and the loud cry happens after the Sunday law. And, and this, this, this is because we're in a repeat of history. That is, our line is a zoom into the Sunday law. That is, when I say our line, 1989, to the Sunday law, is all a zoom in to a way mark on the big line that Ellen White calls the Sunday law. Right. That's what we, we, we determined this. Yeah, we determined this. This isn't well understood in the movement yet. Right? I agree. We've, we've understood this in, in our studies, right. but it hasn't been well understood. Instead, there's still the, the Parminder idea of these priests, Levites, and Nethanim as being these three separate lines that are staggered. Uh, but that never worked because it doesn't happen in Millerite history. Right. So it, it made no sense to take uh, 
that we're repeating Millerite history and have a completely different structure. Right. It life. doesn't seem right now, does it? Yeah, but now we can understand that we can look at Millerite history and we can see that we can zoom in because we did that with Millerite history. Miller has his own line. Snow has a line, right? That's right. There are different lines that exist when you zoom into these different way marks. That's right. And so we can do the same thing in our history. Right. Right. So all of these other histories, the story of Gideon, it can have different applications because every story is parallel. And so if we have a reform line, you could take the story of Gideon and apply it to any reform line. It's going to have the same characteristics. Right. But what we are called to do is we're, because of our study of the book of Judges, is to take the story of Gideon and apply it to our history. That is, we're laying down these stories of the Judges upon our history since 9-11, right? That's what we've been doing. And we can right. see how the story of Gideon does relate to the July 18, 2020 prediction, as Jeff suggested, but that it reaches beyond that, even within our movement, within our line itself. It, it, it's not accomplished on July 18th or December 25th, 2021. I agree. It right. doesn't. Yeah. So, so it's here still, are, it's still yeah. future tense. Well, it's still future for us. That That's is, right. parts of this story of Gideon are referring to events that are going to occur. Um, and you know, then when we get this call to to all of these different groups, I mean, this to me would represent the giving of the message to the Levites. Mm. I mean, even if you look at Judges 7.23, I mean, that's March 27th backwards, right? <clears throat> we're seeing, we're, uh, I'm sorry, we, aren't we seeing um, the connections symbolically with the, the Levites, the, yeah. uh, the different numbers that we've associated with them? Yeah. I mean, so that does tell us something. Well, the 300 itself representing the 273. Right. Yeah. So, so what we have here is, I mean, we know that <clears throat> on the bigger line, this is about a message going to the Protestants. But we know that our movement is, is about a message to the Levites. That's right. Right. Because we have to give the Levites a warning so they'll be ready for the Sunday law. That's that what we've determined over these last few years. Yeah. So, so we know that a certain aspect of our message is we're zooming into some way mark. Um, that is, we have our whole line that is a zoom into the Sunday law, right? And, and we're going to have to draw this at, at some point here. But we know that from 1989 to the Sunday law, our line is just a zoom into a single way mark on Ellen White's line, on the big line. Right. One we see in the great controversy, the Sunday law. She puts Revelation 18 there, but we, we put Revelation 18 at 9 11. And so that means we have the first angel's message being repeated, but it's the empowerment of the first angel's message that is being marked at 9 11. Right. In that context. But we also know that there's a second angel's message which arrives at 9 11. And that second angel's message has, in Millerite history, uh, three way marks attached with it. The arrival, formalization, and the empowerment of that message, which we mark as the first day of the first month, uh, the fifth day of the fourth month, and the first day of the fifth month. So we got April 19th, July 21st, and August 15th. So we have those three way marks that are the second angel's message. The third angel's message arrives October 22nd, 1844. And so when we look at our line, we have this, you know, 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. Well, we wouldn't say that what we're presently involved in. So that is within our movement itself, we have these other lines which are zooming into these way marks of the, our, our bigger line, right? Our bigger line has 9-11 two different 9-11s being symbolized. 
And we also have a midnight and a midnight cry. And we haven't come to midnight yet on that line. Correct? Uh, right. Now, sometimes we think we had, right? Um, we would look at November 9th as, as being midnight. It's gonna be midnight and July 18th be the midnight cry. But what we see is that part of our message is really a zoom into midnight on that line. And, and I'm suggesting that all that we've experienced in connection with um, with our history recently, and, and, and that's where we'd have to try to define where our different lines are, because we, we do have lines that have midnight and midnight cry already on them. And, and the question is, where are those lines? What, what is that midnight? You know, if we say that the midnight cry was, you know, October 13th, 2018, you know, for the priest, that's initially what we tried to look at it as. I mean, that obviously can't be correct, but it is a midnight cry on some line, right? And that's that line, you know, we can really define. We can define it chronologically, um, but we keep having all of these different lines and we have a hard time sorting through them. But if we take, at least we know we're not to midnight yet, that we, we must be zoomed into that midnight way mark, that some aspect of our movement or our message right now, the lines that we see are simply being zoomed into the midnight way mark on that, that line that is the repeat of Millerite history. Does that make sense to people? Do we need to see it? It couldn't hurt. Okay. I think that would be a good idea. Okay. So. Okay. So when we look at a line, <coughs> and I'm not going to deal <clears throat> with Ellen Weiss line. I'm just going to take our line, 1989, um, 9-11. We have midnight, midnight cry, and the Sunday law. So that's that's all I'm going to take of this. Now, <clears throat> this is a repeat. This whole line here is zooming into the Sunday law. So if you're going to take the Sunday law as a waymark, that's a waymark that goes from October 22, 1844. That's the third angel's message arriving. And it's going to continue on here, and it's going to be joined by the Revelation 18. But that's the Sunday law. And then after the Sunday law, you're going to have the loud cry. <clears throat> and Ellen White likens the loud cry to the midnight cry, or the midnight cry to the loud cry. So this is a type of this. But here, we're going to have a midnight cry and a midnight and and all these things here, and the angel of Revelation 18 arriving here. Well, that means this line must be zoomed into this way mark. But now we have events that are happening now. We have a type of the Sunday law that has occurred. So that means our line here that has a Sunday law has to be a zoom into one of these waymarks. And, and I'm also going to put here 9-11, just to confuse people. This is Revelation 9, or whatever the verse is. I can't remember the verse that gives us the third woe. But, you know, the prophecy of Revelation 9 from Millerite history. That's the this, empowerment. Yeah, so this is, this is the empowerment of the first angel. This is the arrival of the second. So we have these two 9-11s. And, and I think we've had different lines. We've had lines in our movement that are actually zooming into this. We've had lines in our movement that are zooming into this. And we have lines in our movement that are zooming into this. 
And my view is that we're presently in a line that's to zoom into midnight. Now, maybe there's even layers here that we didn't see. That is, we could have a line that's a zoom into midnight, and then we can have events that are a zoom, because each time you, you create a zoom in, you're going to create another line, right? So if you have a midnight here, you also have to have a time at the end, et cetera, right? So we're not staggering these lines and laying them over top of each other like we did priest, Levites, and Methanim. We're just zooming into a way mark. So I think that we have had lines where we've zoomed into Revelation 9. We've zoomed into the empowerment of the first angel's message with 9-11. And we had a, a reform line. And then we also had a reform line where we zoomed in here. Now, it's either that we're zoomed into midnight here, it presently, or that we're zoomed into a way mark that's, that's created by this line. And, and that's what we're going to have to define. We're going to have to take these lines, all of these events that have happened, because we know, for instance, we had here October 13th, um, 2018. And how did we mark this? What, what way mark was this when we recognized this event? Midnight cry. Okay, it was the midnight cry. When was it the midnight cry? Why did we call it the midnight cry? Where was midnight? And it was the midnight cry for who? How did we define this? The midnight cry for who? The priests. Okay, so we call it the midnight cry for the priests. Now, a lot of this was built based upon uh, Parminder's understanding of things. And then we had November 9th, 2019. And what was this? Back in 2018, what did we mark this as? If this was the midnight cry for the priest, this was what? And this is Tess here on October 3rd uh, telling us what this was. That was midnight. Well, for the priests? No. Yeah, for the priest, what was it? Sunday law. It was the close of probation, right? That's what we were teaching in 2018. We're saying this is the close of probation for the priests, right? And and of course, they were taking the close of probation to be, you know, let him that is righteous be righteous still. So we had all these people in the movement believing that on November 9th, you know, back here in 2018, that on November 9th, you know, we're going to be sealed and we won't sin anymore, right? That was the theory. Yeah, and I oppose that um, on the 16th and 17th, I think, is when I did my presentations in October. And I oppose that idea, saying that it can only be a close of probation for the false priests, Right, which it ended up being right. the people who and, and the test that was going to be for them was this July 18th. Right. So they reject July 18th. They close their probation. So so we have a, a line here. It's not really well defined where midnight is. <clears throat> um, I sort of put midnight here if I'm going to take this as a line now. And I'm going to put the time at the end here <clears throat> as uh, June 9th. Here, I should make this readable. 
2018, right? Maybe, maybe I do that. Maybe I make this 9-11. You know, the first day of the first month or something like that. And maybe I take um, this June 2nd, 2017 as the time of the end or something. You know, but anyway, if I'm going to create a line with this, I mean, this line here is a zoom into some way mark. But what way mark would this line be a zoom into? Wouldn't a line always zoom into the close of probation that's being marked by that line? Or not always, but generally? You would think. So wouldn't this all be a zoom into the November 9th way mark? Yeah, something like the other line of uh, Ellen, how we've got the, the Sunday law as just right. like a, a yeah. big mark on her line. Yeah. So if we're going to put November 9th here, that's going to be 11.9 is here. And um, uh, July 18th is here. These become midnight and the midnight cry for the next line above this line, right? So this way mark, this, this line that we had here, was a zoom into this way mark, which we called midnight. But this obviously is not the same midnight as this midnight. Because this must be a zoom into this midnight at the very least, right? If we follow that logic, uh, yes. Right. So, so this is what has happened. We've had these, these layers of lines, but these layers of lines are just zooms in, zoom into's of a line above it or a way mark. And so that close of probation that happened here was a zoom into this. But we could also have a zoom into this one, right? That is July 18th itself can have a reform line attached to it. Right. So either we're zoomed into this or we're zoomed into this. Now, of course, July 18th becomes a close of probation. So I'm arguing that we've already passed this way mark. That there was a zoom into this way mark that had to do with December 25th, 2021, right? Yes. Okay. And that we could take the line of Gideon attached to that maybe because the line of Gideon is represented by this. That's what we've concluded. Yeah. So, so we're still kind of zoomed into this one. I mean, we, we had, and we have a division that occurs within this line, but maybe the close of probation for this line is still coming up. I don't know. Right. But you see that you see the complexity that can happen. These wheels within wheels. Right. And at first complete co appear to be confusion. But as we continue to examine them, we start to see a perfect order. It becomes much clearer. Yeah. And we just haven't defined where all these lines are yet and which way marks. But we can say that at least this line that we had had in 2018 must have been a zoom into this way mark. And this here, this line is, is addressing Parminder's movement, his message, right? And they end up with the close of probation here on November. That's right, because they have their own line. Yeah. Right? Isn't yeah. that what we've determined? Everybody's has <coughs> their own line. Yeah. Now, of course, there's a true message here and a false. And so... It de demonstrates and develops two classes of worshipers. And so by November 9th, we definitely see those two classes of worshipers demonstrated and developed. Right? right? But of course, this is a typical line. 
But that's what November 9th showed, is that you're going to have the false priests develop their character, and they're going to close their probation. Now, I'm never saying anything about individuals in a movement. I'm just talking about a line as a symbol. Right. Right. So who knows? There could be individuals that will repent and so forth uh, and, and, and turn and accept the truth who were attached to this, appeared to have closed their probation here. I know that some of the people from this movement that were involved in accepting Parminder are still reading my papers. Mm. Some, right? And the fact that they're doing that tells me something. Either they're just looking for information to justify their position, or they're maybe becoming dissatisfied with their movement. God works in mysterious ways. But we know then that we must have moved to this way, Mark, to July 18th, when we started making the July 18th proclamation. We started studying this. After November 9th, this probation closes. We're now in another reform line. Now, we know that July 18th involves more than just the date July 18th because it's part of a structure of 777 days. It begins on November 9th. Right. So November 9th becomes a way mark in when you zoom in here, right? Because it doesn't mean that you when you have a new reform line that none of those other way marks apply. They can still apply. They can still exist within that zoom in, right? So November 9th. Well, the happen. structure gives us some sort of information that, that connects them. Yeah. So, so we haven't defined this all really well yet, but we can see that this makes sense. That this, this is the best way to look at these lines. It's beginning to make a much more sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so so I hope that's helpful. I mean, Ron says it's helpful. Um, and so our our time is up. Uh, well, it goes by quick. So we, we still have to uh, uh, deal with some of these symbols. Oreb and Zeb, um, and, and what this represents as far as understanding this line of Gideon and where we would place this line of Gideon specifically. Um, but I would say it's a zoom into July 18. But it's going to have included in it the December 25th, 2021 waymark. So the July 18th reform line doesn't end on July 18th. We don't have a close of probation on July 18th. <clears throat> any final thoughts on any of this? Okay, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we've had to study here this morning. Um, we're thankful for the light that has been given for our feet, that we can walk in that light today. Help us to walk in the light while we have it to stay on this path that leads to the celestial city. We need to have your character. These earthen vessels must be broken, that your character, that your gospel can shine forth, that people can be drawn to you. Be with each of us. Help us to follow and serve you today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.